The PLO, Palestinian Liberation Organization, was originally created on May 28, 1964. The goal of the PLO was to get liberation for Palestine through armed struggle, which was mostly aimed at Israeli civilians. The PLO ran the Palestinian National Authority, which was a semi-autonomous government and maintained Palestinian territories, until a deal was made with Israel. <clears throat> they were trying to achieve a united Palestine and Israel with various Arab groups. At first, the PLO wasn't thought of as violent, but as the years went on, they adopted certain unorthodox method methods, which were borderline terrorism. After losing the Six-Day War to Israel, the PLO stepped up their military presence, and the PLO was taken over by the military leader Yasser Arafat. Arafat was at the forefront of years of violence, border disputes, and the Palestinian liberation movement, all centering on neighboring Israel. The Palestine Liberation, or PLO, was first founded in 1964 during a summit in Cairo, Egypt. The organization's initial goals were to unite various Arab groups and create a liberated Palestine in Israel. Over time, the PLO has embraced a border, border role claiming to represent all Palestinians while running the Palestine National Authority, PA. Also, the PLO wasn't known to be violent during this, this, its early years. The organization became associated with controversial tactics, terrorism, and extremism. The PLO emerged in response to various com compounding events that took place in the Middle East. In 1948, Israel became an independent state, which resulted in more than 7,500,000 Palestinians fleeing their homeland. The 1948 war set the stage for, for years of tension and violence between Arabs and Israel's people. Around this time, Palestinians were spread out among, among several countries, lacked formal leadership, and weren't organized. This li limited their political influence and presence. After the Arab-Israel Six-Day War, of 1967, in which Israel emerged various victorious, the PLO began to ramp up their presence. A group known as Fatah, led by military leader Yasser Arafat, started started to dominate the organization. In 1969, Arafat became chairman of the PLO's executive committee, holding the title until his death in 2004. Uh, the in 1964, the PLO was formed during the Arab League Summit. The Palestine National Council uh, was comprised of Palestinian civilians who defined the group's goals, including the destruction of Israel. After the Six-Day War in 1967, the PLO became more prominent after Israel's victory, and Yasser Arafat, the leader of the Fatah, a military group, infiltrated the PLO and became, became chairman of the PLO's executive committee holding the position until his death in 2004. And the structure of the PLO is divided up into four groups. The Palestine National Council, the PNC. The PNC sets the PLO's policies and determines who is elected to certain committees. The Executive Committee, which oversees daily affairs, determines the budget, and represents international affairs. The Central Council, that has 124 members who serve as an intermediary to the PNC and Executive Committee, and the Palestine Liberation Army, whose official who is the official military branch of the PLO, which was established in 1964. Yasser Arafat was born on August 24, 1929, in Cairo, Egypt, to a Palestinian father and an Egyptian mother. He was raised in Cairo, but always considered himself Palestinian. After his graduation from the Cairo University, Arafat was commissioned as a lieutenant in the Egyptian army. The year 1964 was seminal for Arafat, marking the founding of the Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO, which brought together a number of groups working to toward a free Palestinian state. Three years later, the Six-Day War erupted, with Israel once again pitted against the Arab states. Once again, Israel prevailed, and in the aftermath of Arafat's Fatah, gained control of the PLO when he became the chairman of the PLO Executive Committee in 1969. In the years since his death, conspiracy theories regarding the true cause of Arafat's demise have abounded, many holding Israel responsible. In November 2013, researchers in, researchers in Switzerland released a report revealing that tests conducted on Arafat's remains and some of his belongings support the theory that the late Egyptian leader was poisoned. Evidence from the report suggests that radioactive polonium, a highly toxic substance, had been used. Suha Arafat, Yasser Arafat's widow, 
supported the findings in media interviews as proof of Arafat's murder. Other authorities, including a Russian medical investigation team called to the case, have maintained that they believe Arafat died of natural causes. In 2011, the PA made a bid for full member state status in the UN. Although this attempt failed, the UN General Assembly voted to make Palestine a non-member observer state in 2012. This dis uh, distinction allows Palestinians to participate in General Assembly debates and improves their odds of eventually joining UN agencies. And another step forward, the PLO became a member of the International Criminal Court in 2015. Currently, Mohammed Abbas serves as the PLO's chairman and president of the PA. Abbas is considered relatively moderate and has voiced um, opposed, um, opposition to violence in past conflicts. The PLO's present efforts have focused on achieving international recognition of Palestinian statehood. However, a two-state solution is a controversial plan that Israel's Prime Minister and the United States both oppose. In fact, in 2017, U.S. President Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, generating disapproval among Arabs and other allies. Hello, and today on Baghdad, Channel 12, Lydia and I will be discussing Israel's Prime Minister not being able to form a government. Jacob will be discussing the troops being taken out of Syria and the thoughts of the Kurdish people and the effects of all these events. Lastly, Dominic will be covering Iraq. Lydia, give us the rundown. So right now, Israel's Prime Minister is Benjamin Netanyahu. He is Israel's longest serving leader. He has been unable to form a coalition government. No one can come to an agreement, and he hasn't made any further efforts towards it. He recently published a video on his 70th birthday talking about how he worked consistently to forge a broad national unity government. He also did so with his political rival and former army chief, Benny Gantz, blue and white party, but ultimately failed. Netanyahu made the announcement two days before his deadline. He returned the mandate to the president, Reuven Rivlin. Rivlin intends to have Gantz to have the job of putting together a new government. This will be the first in over a decade that anyone but Netanyahu would be given the chance to head the Israel government. Luckily, this won't end Netanyahu's political career. Once Gantz is asked, he will have 28 days to attempt to have a coalition. If it does not happen, another election may have to be called. Many in Israel are predicting that he will also fail. Now to you, Jacob, in Syria. President Trump controversially pulled U.S. troops out of Syria a few weeks ago. Since then, the Turks have pushed the Kurds completely out of Turkey and into northern Syria. Turkey used the chemical white phosphorus on the Kurds, which burns the skin. Wait. Breaking news from the White House. The ISIS leader is dead. More details to come from President Trump. President Trump, represent. Quiet down, please. Abu Bakar Akabadi died like a dog. He died like a coward, he killed three children and himself. He's a coward. Good night. So back in Syria, Russian troops have stepped in between the Kurds and the Turks, and President Trump lifted all sanctions on Turkey after they agreed to a ceasefire. Over to Dominic in Iraq. Hey guys. Welcome to Iraq. First off, I'm going to talk about Iraq's history, just a little bit. In August 1990, Saddam Hussein, which was the ruler of Iraq at the time, unexpectedly seized Kuwait, capturing it in 48 hours and incorporating it as Iraq's 19th province. Saddam's invasion would lead to what was the most massive American military action in the Middle East since 
World War II. It was called the Gulf War. Now I'm going to talk about Iraq's economy today. Iraq's state-dominated economy is led by the oil sector, which provides about 85% of government revenue. The war against the Islamic State exposed a high cost on the economy, which also has been hurt by rampant corruption, terrible oil prices, and a war-damaged infrastructure. We will keep you updated on the situations in Israel, Iraq, and Syria. See you tomorrow on Baghdad, Channel 12. Coming up next on Channel 12 is a 24-hour marathon of The Simpsons. Enjoy and have a good night. Go. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, and good night. This is the world news of M. O. L. K. A. G. Molkag News. Um, in 1946, M Mustafa Barzani formed the Kurdistan Dem Democratic Party, KDP, to fight for autonomy in Iraq, but it was not until 1961 that he launched a full armed struggle. The policy was accelerated in the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq War, in which the Kurds backed the Islamic Republic. Today, they form a distinctive community, united through race, culture, and language. Even though they have no standard dialect, they also adhere to a number of different regions and creeds, although the majority are Sunni Muslims. Between 25 and 35 million Kurds inhabit a mountainous region straddling the borders of Turkey, Iraq, Syria, Iran, and Armenia. They make up the fourth largest ethnic group in the Middle East, but they have never obtained a permanent nation state. In September 2014, IS launched an assault on the enclave around the northern Syrian Kurdish town of Kobain, forcing tens of hundreds of tens of thousands of people to flee across the nearby Turkish border. Despite the proximity of the fighting, Turkey refused to attack IS positions or allow Turkish Kurds to cross to defend it. In January 2015, after a battle that left at least 1,600 people dead, Kurdish forces regained control of Kobain. Turkey killed over 200 people. 70,000 Syrian people have been, help, have been left homeless due to Turkey sol Turkish soldiers. Syrian troops are heading north to confront the Turkish army and there are ISIS civilian camps that Turkey has taken over or, have, or they've actually killed the Kurdish soldiers that have been protecting the ISIS civilian camps and 83,000 ISIS civilians are running wild now. And there are also civilian camps in the way of the Turkey army there's 30, 32,000 Syrian civilians. Recently, the U.S. has pulled troops out of Syria. The, they are considering leaving troops behind to secure oil fields in the region and to make sure it doesn't go into the hands of a resurgent Islamic State. There is still air patrol in the air watching over the U.S. troops leaving the country. The U.S. President Donald Trump announced that Turkey said it would be stopping combat operations and making a ceasefire in northern Syria permanent, prompting the United States to lift recent sanctions it imposed on Turkish imports in response to the campaign. The sanctions will be, he said, the sanctions will be lifted unless something happens that we are not happy with, Trump said. Breaking news. The U.S. military operation that targeted ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi got underway on the ground in northwest Syria at 5.01 p.m. Details of the operation continue to emerge. Al-Baghdadi is said to have detonated a suicide vest as he hid in a tunnel in his compound, killing himself and three children who were near in Idb Idlib, Syria. Also, luckily, no U.S. service members were killed in the raid, but one dog was hurt, but is on track to have a successful surgery. Russia wants the U.S. to leave Syria and has repeatedly stated that it believes the U.S. is in Syria is legal. illegal. Through Russia and Turkey support opposing sides in Syrian war, Russia would certainly welcome a full U.S. withdrawal from Syria because it would give Moscow even more 
leverage not just in shaping Syria's future, but costing the entire middle. Russia and Turkey agree Tuesday on a plan to push Syrian Turkish fighters from a wide width of ter territory just south of Turkey's border, committing Russian President Voldemort Putin's permanent role in Syria as U.S. troops deport and Americans influence wings. Russia is creating states and region to recognize the Syrian government's authority. Uh, right now in Turkey, since the U.S. troops have left, they started using chemical attacks such as white phosphorus and napalm. Um, they're fighting against the Kurds because they're afraid of them owning land near them. Uh, Turkey and Russia have started working together and they're helping push the Kurds out of Turkey. Um, they're, ho they're hoping they can push them back far enough to create a space for all the homeless Syrian people. Um, Turkey launched their first submarine project where they will be designing, developing, and producing the submarines. Uh, Russia and Turkey announced an agreement that would establish joint Russian and Turkish patrols during much of the Turkish and Sir Syrian border within six days. Bingo. Good afternoon, everyone. We will be covering several topics. Syria today, Turkey today, Iran history, and Israel history. Starting off with Syria today. Trump withdraws troops from Syria. Some troops may stay in Syria to keep guard of the oil field so Islamic groups don't get a hold of them. They are having overhead surveillance the best they can while some of the U.S. troops are being pulled out. They are going to try their best to monitor everything. The al hol camp in Syria is home of about 70,000 people, but most are children and women. Guns and other weapons keep being snuck into the camp, allowing ISIS members to go out and do whatever they please. There was a young boy in the camp that was stabbed to death by a group of ISIS women. No one knows why the violence has all of a sudden broke out, but that when the guards tried to interfere, a gunfight broke out that had killed another woman. Last but not least, unlawful weapons were being used around the year 2018. There were 36 munition attacks in 2017 and 2018. Between the years 2013 and 2018, the Human Rights Watch investigated and found that 85 chemical weapon attacks were confirmed. Now handing it off to David Miller with Turkey Today. For Turkey, Donald Trump just lifted all sanctions that were put in place because of their attacks on Syria. The Syrian ceasefire was also stated to be permanent. Russia also has become a power player in the Middle East because Putin has started to work with Erdogan, which is the leader of Turkey. Russian jets also patrol Syrian bases and it is looking clear that Russia will be the arbiter of power balance. It's also just came to light that uh, U.S. spies have found evidence of militias that are backed by Turkey that are killing civilians. Now on to Emily with Iran history. Before we talk about the history of, of Iran, breaking news, um, on Sunday morning, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi was pronounced dead after a military raid in northwest Syria. There was no U.S. deaths during the operation. Trump said that he died like a dog, he died like a coward, and the world is a much safer place. Now on to Iran's history. Iran used to be a vibrant, cultured, beautiful country to now a restricting and oppressive rule. Iran looked a lot different to the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Before the revolution, women dressed in a different way. After the revolution, women were required to wear headscarves, and if they were seen without them in public, they would receive two years of jail time. Before the revolution, men and women were taught in the same classroom, but after they were separated into two different classrooms. Also, before the revolution, the Iranian leaders were much more open to meeting people from around the world. For instance, the Shah family met with John F. Kennedy. The two leaders shook hands in front of reporters. Today, this is an unlikely situation. Last but not least, destiny with the history of Israel. In 1917, at the height of the war, British Foreign uh, Secure Arthur James Balfour submitted a letter to intent supporting the establishment of Jew Jewish homeland in Palestine. 
the British government hoped that the formal declaration known thereafter as the Balfour Declaration would encourage support for the Allies in World War I. Also, tensions between Jews and Arab Muslims have existed. The complex host hostility I'm sorry, between the two group dates all the way back to ancient times when they both populated the area and deemed it holy. Both Jews and Muslims consider the city of Jerusalem sacred. The United Nations approved a plan to uh, partition Palestine into a Jewish and Arab state in 1947, but the Arabs rejected it. In May 1948, Israel was officially declared an independent state with David Ben Gurion, the head of the Jewish agency, as a prime minister. And that's all the news for today. Hey. Welcome back to CSS News. Today we are at the Israel Historic Museum discussing the history of Israel. Around 722 BC, the Aryans invaded and demolished the northern kingdom of Israel. In 568 BC, the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the first temple, which was replaced in 516 BC. For the next 2,000 years, the land of Israel was conquered by many groups, such as the Persians, Greeks, Romans, Arabs, that's just to name a few. From 1517 to 1970, Israel was a part of the Ottoman Empire. And in 1917, the British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour sent a formal declaration for the Jewish people to gain their support. The form was known as the Balfour Declaration. It stated that the, that the Jewish people would be granted Palestine as their homeland if they would help the Allied troops. After World War I, Great Britain took control over Palestine, which was modern-day Israel, Palestine, and Jordan. The British controlled Israel until May 14, 1948. In 1947, the United Nations approved a plan to split Palestine into Jewish and Arab state, but the Arabs rejected it. Israel declared its independence on May 14, 1948. The Arab-Israeli war broke out almost immediately following this announcement, when Arab nations surrounding Israel invaded far Palestinian territory. The year before, the UN adopted Resolution 181, which would divide Palestine into Jewish and Arab states. The Arab-Israeli War ended in March of 1949 when Israel finally came to an agreement with the Arab states surrounding it. Israel won the war, Jordan had a partial victory, and the Palestinian Arabs were defeated as well as the Egyptians. As a result of the Arab-Israeli War, Israel controlled the area that the UN General Assembly Resolution 181 had said would be a Jewish state, as well as 60% of the Arab state proposed in 1947 by the partition plan. A set of agreements were signed during 1949 called the Armistice Agreements. These agreements were signed between Israel and Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. They established armistice lines between Isra Israeli forces and Jordanian Iraqi forces and ended the hostilities of the 1948 Arab-Israeli War. These lines held until 1967. Breaking news, the leader of ISIS, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was killed in American raids Sunday night. In 1967, the Israel Defense Forces launched airstrikes that crippled the Air Force of Egypt and its allies. Then, Israel staged a successful ground offensive and seized the Sinai Peninsula and the Gaza Strip from Egypt, the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, and the Golan Heights from Syria. And then in 1982, Israel invaded Lebanon for the purpose of attacking the Pal Pal Palestine Liberation Organization. Israel forces quickly reached Beirut, where they laid siege to Lebanon's capital. According to people in Lebanon, between 15,000 and 20,000 people were killed, and most of them were citizens of Lebanon. I'm going to be looking back at the ongoing struggle between the Israelis and the Palestinians in 1987, that led to violence, riots, general strikes, and civil disobedience campaigns by Palestinian Arabs spread across the West Bank and Gaza Strip. 
Israeli forces responded with tear gas, plastic bullets, and live ammunition. The origins of the conflict can be traced back to the Jewish immigration and sectarian conflict in mandatory Palestine between Jews and Arabs. The key issues in the conflict were mutual recognition, borders, security, water rights, control of Jerusalem, Israeli settlements, Palestinian freedom of movement, and Palestinian right of return. On April 11, 1978, King Hassan of Jordan and Israeli Foreign Minister Shimon Peers signed the London Agreement during a secret meeting held at the residence of Lord Michigan in London. December 9th, Israel Palestinian conflict first begins violence, riots, general strikes, and civil disobedience companions by Palestine Arabs spread across the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Israel force responds with tear gas, plastic bullets, and ammunition. On September 13, 1993, Prime Minister Mr. Rabin of Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization Chairman Yasser Arafat shook hands in a public ceremony at the, at the White House after signing an agreement that granted limited ammunition to Palestine and laid the foundation for future peace talks. On December 30, 1993, the State of Israel, recalling its Declaration of Independence, affairs its continuing commitment to uphold and observe the human right of, to freedom of religion and conscience, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And back to Carl with the weather. My story will start at the current events of Israel, particu particularly 2000 and now. In May of 2000, Israel pulled troops out of Lebanon after the collapse of the SLA and the advance advancement of he Hezbollah forces. Two years later, Israel put on the defensive in the West Bank after a spew of Palestinian suicide bombings. And this was the largest military advancement in the West Bank since the 1960s. Later that year, Israel started building walls in and around the West Bank, supposedly to protect against terror attacks from Palestinians, but the Palestinians, on the other hand, see this as a tactic to uh, grab land. And then in 2003, a plan was made to resolve this conflict in the West Bank, and Palestinians had agreed to stay peacefully, and Israelis agreed, agreed to leave them alone. But in 2005, Israel leaves the Gaza Strip and then decides to keep all their air, water, and border in their control. So, and then 2006, I guess, Palestinians wanted to get back at them, so they elected Islamic groups into parliament. And by coincidence, maybe, Israel faces uh, rocket attacks from Gaza. These a actions were met with raids because they did not believe it was a coincidence. So then in the months of July and August, Israel goes from Lebanon, Lebanon in response to a hostage situation, and the second Lebanese war <laughs> happens. Fighting continues, and in December 2008, Israel launches a full-long invasion of Gaza. Next year, February 2009, Benjamin Netanyahu forms the present-day government that they have today. And then you go two years later, uh, talk will continue between the Palestinians and Israelis. Two more years later, Netanyahu will replace all the Jewish groups with secular groups, non-religious. It was because he thought they were getting radical. And then in December 2013, Israel, along with Jordan, Jordan and Palestinian Authority, signed an agreement to pump water from the Red Sea into the Dead Sea to prevent it from drying up. In 2016, Israel and the country Jordan normalized relations. Pal Palestine and Jordan hadn't, but Israel and Jordan had. So, and then um, September of 2016, the U.S. sets up a military aid package to Israel, and they will they will receive 38 billion over the next 10 years. And that was a uh, like four years ago. And then my most recent thing was in December of 2017, Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. He angered many people, and he he also made a lot of people happy. So that's all I really have for the present day of Israel. Thank you.